you want to join me in uh, reading the scripture <coughs> this morning, we're in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, reading from verse 38. Matthew 5 and verse 38. Jesus is <coughs> speaking to his congregation, which we generally call the Sermon on the Mount, which was a series of sermons. Then he comes to one of the most difficult parts of his preaching for the day. You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And that reminds me because I broke a tooth during the week. Not because someone thought they would get even with me, but uh, because of old age, I think. And I thought to myself, I would not like to lose a tooth because someone has has uh, in their mind thought that they would get even with me. It's a painful business to lose a tooth. It had been said, Jesus says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Some sort of a sense of justice in some people's mind. But Jesus said, I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And you've only got two, so that you're lucky that there's only two cheeks. And if any man will sue thee at the law, take away and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbour and hate thine enemy. But, again Jesus says, I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans the same be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect do you agree with me, with me that this was probably the most difficult sermon for people to accept when Jesus preached those multiple sermons on the mountain side that weekend I think some of you at least will agree because I didn't see one head nod I believe that it is, because loving your enemies is not an easy thing to do. Normally we think that an enemy ought to be treated as an enemy. That is, in the typical human way of thinking. An enemy as an en is an enemy and he should be removed from your influence as quickly as possible. And various methods have been used and still are used to remove enemies and get them out of your hair. Enemies can range from someone who just aggravates you and annoys you to the bank manager who disagrees with your philosophy of finance or it may be someone who is at war with you or a terrorist whom you haven't yet identified. Whichever way it may be, and whatever the case may be, and there are many circumstances and individuals which are enemies to our thinking, we try and find some way of removing them from our presence so that they no longer have any influence over us, either physically, mentally, morally, or any other way. And to do that, we might resort to many and various methods. From open warfare to warfare of words to uh, um, the silent treatment, it might mean <coughs> using all kinds of methods of getting the enemy away out there somewhere, out of the road, where he's not seen, where he's not heard, 
where he doesn't affect me anymore. <clears throat> Our enemy might be someone who is physically abusive to us. He might be someone who is requesting of us something that we do not want to give. And our self-centeredness uh, might preventing us, be preventing us from wanting to lend our coat or to lend our money or our time or our influence. We might consider such a person an enemy. We mightn't want to give to someone who asks. Even when that someone asks things pertaining to spiritual things, asks for knowledge, asks for information. Sometimes people want to protect it and don't really want to give it up. And such was the case with the Jewish nation when Jesus preached this sermon. They had information and they had knowledge of, of God's handling of the human race. They had information about the Messiah who was to come and redeem the human race from the predicament they were in with the problem of sin. They had knowledge that the Messiah would be arriving soon, but they didn't want to give the knowledge away because they felt it was for them and for them alone. They felt that they were the protectors of the good things that God had been willing to share with humanity. Some of them even thought that they were the only real humanity. And anyone outside of the Jewish nation was some sort of subhuman species and not worthy of hearing of the good things that God had promised through his prophets, who of course were Jews. <clears throat> Sometimes we are a little like that ourselves, aren't we? Sometimes there are good things that we could offer, but uh, far from that, sometimes there are good things that are asked for, and we're not too keen to give it away. Whether it be dollars and cents, whether it be our time, whether it be our talents, whether it be our influence. But when it comes to doing something like this, not even solicited by an enemy, that makes it even harder. Think for a moment of some person whom you consider to be or have been your enemy. And see whether you feel like giving that enemy all these things that Jesus said you should give him. But worse than that, Consider whether or not you can really love that person. It's pretty hard to do, isn't it? Everyone has had someone do something that has upset them. Everyone has had someone who has said something that has been cruel and has cut to the heart. Everyone has an enemy somewhere and has had it sometime. But do you feel like actually loving that person? Jesus said that this was the utmost in perfection. And this word perfect here we find in verse 48 is actually a word which means mature. Come to maturity. So Jesus is saying when you have come to maturity, you will love your enemies. So a mature Christian is someone who loves his enemies. That is the sign of Christian maturity. I wonder... Who measures up to that sign, that measuring mark of Christian maturity that they love their enemies? I do believe that everyone who has seriously taken the name of Christ, everyone who has seriously understood what Jesus has done for them as an individual is quite able to reach this measurement of maturity. They are quite able to love their enemies. It's when we move away from our appreciation of Jesus and what he has done for us that we seem to fall short of the ideal maturity of loving our enemies. The last few months, have you had an experience where you lacked the spiritual maturity 
I imagine that you have at some stage. I imagine somebody annoyed you so much that you hoped that you wouldn't have to bother with them again. I guess that some people did something to you that reduced your finances perhaps a little more than you would hope. And that was upsetting to you. I guess someone wanted more time from you than you thought that they really should have had. And it upset your plans a little bit. I guess someone said something that uh, annoyed you. And you thought to yourself, they should know better. And uh, they upset you. And you thought, I'm not going to bother with, uh, with that subject again. And uh, we'll keep clear of that. I guess there's something that's happened to everybody in the last few months and I'm thinking of the terms between when we last partook of the communion service until today, I'm guessing that something has happened where you slipped up in your Christian maturity, your Christian perfection, and you loved somebody somewhere less than you ought to have done. If that's the case, then here's your opportunity today to come back to your Christian maturity, to love your enemy. For that's the sign, Jesus said, of true Christian maturity. Jesus was talking to people who didn't really understand this stuff at all. They'd been brought up to take an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and to smite on one cheek and on the other cheek, to exact everything that they could to get your pound of flesh. But Jesus put a different turn to living entirely and he says if you want to be mature and this would have upset the Jewish leaders particularly if you want to be mature if you want to be perfect you will love your enemies Jesus when he went to the cross exemplified everything that he spoke about in this sermon for when Jesus went to the cross from the Garden of Gethsemane till the moment when his last breath expired, fulfilled entirely what he preached about. You would expect him to if he was the Saviour, if he was the example of godliness, wouldn't you? But how few people looked for it. I wonder how many people on that day looked to see whether Jesus would fulfill this spiritual maturity that he was talking about, this God-given attribute of loving your enemies. I wonder how many people looked for it in Jesus at that moment. I doubt if too many did. Peter was very enthusiastic for Jesus and his cause, and when the people came to take him away, this rabble came to take uh, Jesus away, Peter stood up for Jesus, and uh, in no time he had whipped off the ear of the high priest's servant, and the poor guy was walking around in circles looking at an ear on the ground there. And Peter was elated. At least I got his ear. Peter, of course, wasn't too good with a sword. He's better with a fisherman's knife, I guess. I guess if one or two of the others had used the sword, the fellow would have been looking at his body from his head on the ground. But Peter was happy enough that he got an ear. But Jesus wasn't happy. That wasn't Christian maturity. Jesus wasn't happy. He picked up the ear and shook the dust of it and put it back on the poor guy's head and in an instant he was healed. Jesus loved his enemy. I wonder if that man was yet an enemy for Jesus as he went to the cross. As Jesus stood before his accusers, his demeanor was such that they had never seen before of one of, of peacefulness, one of serenity. And he gave evidence that he was concerned for those who accused him. And he even gave Pilate an opportunity to rethink the course of action that he had taken. Jesus loved even Herod, and he loved Pilate, and he loved Caiaphas, and he loved those who took him to the cross. Jesus had compassion and love for everyone associated with his crucifixion. Those who nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. He said, God forgive them, Father forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. Almost a prayer to say they have to be excused for this. They never have the opportunity to know 
what they should have known. The leaders, the teachers, have held back that which they should have been able to uh, enlighten the people on. God forgive them. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died fulfilling entirely what he had preached about. He died for his enemies. For you and I were the enemies of God. The Apostle Paul takes up the thought when he so... Uh, bluntly tells people that we were once the enemies of God. We were once the enemies of Christ. And that Jesus died while we were yet sinners. Sinners are enemies of Christ and his cause. And Jesus died because we were his enemies. He died so that he might reconcile us unto him, so that we as enemies might see what the other side of the equation really is that we might see that love paves the way to eternity. So as we consider what Jesus has done for us, how can we help but love our enemies? Has anybody hurt you in the past few months? Has anyone upset you? Perhaps not here, but anywhere, in business, in pleasure, in your societies and clubs, Anywhere at all, has the family been a pain to you at some stage and you've been upset with them and felt as though you couldn't do anything more, or didn't want to do anything more for them? Maybe it was the minister. Maybe he's your enemy at the moment. Well, the minister asks for forgiveness if he's done anything to upset you. But in return, he says to you, you better even love the minister. Jesus says that Christian maturity is in place. It's arrived at. It's there when you love your enemies. You can love your enemy again today as you contemplate what Jesus has done. For when you contemplate what Jesus has done, there's no more enemies really, is there? Not real enemies, because if you love your enemy, he's no longer your enemy. She's no longer your enemy. She's someone who's in your mind. He's someone who's in your mind as one whom Jesus cared for to the point of where he would die for them. As we contemplate Jesus, we see that he fulfilled all those marvelous attributes of an enemy hater who becomes an enemy lover. I'm glad today that Jesus is an enemy lover and that Jesus died because he loves me. I'm glad today that many people are no longer enemies of Jesus and Jesus doesn't have to die again for those people who have loved and served him or for anybody for that matter. He doesn't have to die again because he demonstrated once and for all what it is to love your enemies and he loves you and he loves me. And he wants us to enter into that spiritual maturity of love for everyone. As we celebrate the communion service, we do so to remind ourselves once again of the love and compassion of our Saviour. Before we go out to wash one another's feet, we'll ask you to bow your heads in prayer and we'll invite the Lord to especially bless that little service. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus exemplified in his life even to his moment of death the fact that he loved those who opposed him and uh, <coughs> we have loved each other but at times we have felt in our hearts annoyed or aggravated something which uh, we shouldn't have felt some emotion that we let run a little we pray for forgiveness we pray that as we wash one another's feet we will do so with mindful of the fact that we are exemplifying the love of Jesus for our fellow brethren today. So dismiss us to the foot washing service, we pray, please, with clean hands and pure hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.